Good morning, scholars of earth and environmental science. You've very likely heard about pollution before. You probably know that it's generally a bad thing. With the development of industrial capitalism in the early 1800s, many types of contamination have been introduced into the world. Pollution is one of the biggest environmental problems that our society faces. It touches all of our lives. Hopefully today, we can develop a more nuanced understanding of pollution and be able to explain the variety of adverse effects. Pollution touches on all of Earth systems that we've discussed, the lithosphere, hydrosphere, atmosphere, and the biosphere. We can define pollution as the undesirable change in air, water, or soil that negatively affects the health, survival, or activities of any organisms. Pollution affects the world at both local and global levels. In this lecture, we'll go over some basic concepts about air and water pollution. Next week, we'll talk more specifically about climate change and some particular issues that affect North Carolina. There are many different substances that can build up in the air to unhealthy levels. Scientists classify them as either primary or secondary pollutants. Primary pollutants are put directly into the air, for example, soot from smoke. Secondary pollutants form when primary pollutants combine with other substances in the air, such as water vapor. While some pollutants enter the atmosphere through natural processes, like volcanoes or pollen, most air pollutants come due to human activities. We're going to break up air pollutants into a variety of categories. First are sulfur oxides, like sulfur dioxide or sulfur trioxide. These are created by burning fossil fuels, because fossil fuels have sulfur in it, which combines with oxygen in the air during combustion reactions. Sulfur oxides also make their way into the air during volcanic eruptions. These sulfur oxides can bond with water and air, which creates sulfuric acid, which can fall down as acid rain or acid snow or any other kind of acid precipitation. Nitrogen oxides are similarly created when nitrogen bonds with oxygen in the presence of high temperatures. This can happen in cases like thunderstorms, combustion engines, power plants, and industrial boilers. Nitrogen oxides make the body vulnerable to respiratory infections, contribute to the brown haze we see over cities, and cause acid rain. They can also exacerbate the greenhouse effect. Nitrogen dioxide in particular is an even worse greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Next we have carbon oxides. Carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide are specifically the ones we're talking about. These are created um, from volcanoes again, but also most predominantly from combustion engines that we usually find in cars. Carbon monoxide can interfere with the blood's ability to carry oxygen, which can cause drowsiness or death. This is why your home has a carbon monoxide detector. Carbon dioxide, also produced from car exhaust, is the quintessential greenhouse gas. Volatile organic compounds are organic chemicals, meaning they contain carbon, that vaporize readily and turn into toxic fumes. These come from a variety of sources, particularly burning fuel, and they can cause smog and harm plants. The last category is particulate matter. This differs from the other gases because this category groups tiny particles of liquid or solid matter that pollute the air. These come from construction, agriculture, and forest fires. Vehicles and industry also produce them. They result in clouds that reduce visibility and cause respiratory problems like cancer. One third of all air pollution comes from gasoline burned by vehicles. Each car releases about five tons of carbon dioxide every year, along with a laundry list of other pollutants, nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, and volatile organic compounds. To combat this, the Environmental Protection Agency has regulated American vehicle emissions.
This is why you have to get your car inspected annually. We've talked before in the astronomy unit about the ozone layer in the Earth's stratosphere. It has helped our planet from becoming a barren wasteland by shielding us from some UV radiation. However, in the troposphere, ozone is a secondary pollutant. The troposphere, remember, is the lowest level of the atmosphere where we live. When nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds react with sunlight, they can produce ozone. Ozone in the troposphere, at our level, is not helpful in the slightest. It can inflame lung tissue, irritate the respiratory tract, which causes harm to people with pre-existing conditions like asthma or COPD. In addition, ozone is largely responsible for the smog we see in urban areas where car traffic is very prevalent, like Los Angeles, for example. In the late 1970s, scientists discovered an alarming effect in the stratosphere above the polar regions. The ozone layer was getting thinner. This is what we see in the diagram down there, where blue indicates a lack of ozone, and purple even worse, so we can see it getting worse over time. In addition, the overall levels of ozone around the world were decreasing. This would potentially increase the amount of UV radiation impacting the Earth's surface, which would heighten our risk for skin cancer and harm plants and animals. For example, Extra UV light exposure could kill off the eggs of amphibians and interfere with the photosynthesis of phytoplankton and land plants. So why was the ozone depleting? A class of chemicals called chlorofluorocarbons, often abbreviated as CFCs, these were used extensively as refrigerants and in a variety of consumer products like hairspray and paint. While these were chemically stable at the troposphere, when they made their way into the stratosphere, UV light would cause these molecules to break down, releasing free chlorine atoms. These would react with ozone to form chlorine monoxide and O2 gas. The chlorine monoxide would then react with more ozone in a chain reaction. Essentially, the CFCs would break down these ozone molecules very quickly. So, in 1987, governments met in Montreal and agreed to reduce the amount of CFCs. It has been somewhat successful, although CFCs can remain in the atmosphere for 60 to 120 years, so it will take a while before the ozone layer can recover. But we can look on the bright side that in 2019, the ozone layer, um, or the ozone hole around the South Pole was the smallest it ever was, due to... Uh, weather phenomenon with the polar vortex, but still, it's helpful to be optimistic. Another major air pollution problem is the air pollution inside our houses. Faulty appliances, household chemicals, and other consumer products can cause the air quality within a building to actually be worse than the outside air quality. It's important to remove strong sources and ventilate buildings well with outside air. You can look at this picture here to see where um, a variety of air pollutants might be created in your house. An interesting indoor air pollution phenomenon is what happens when uranium-bearing rocks underground gradually decay over time. One of their decay products is a gas called radon. This can make its way up through the foundations of buildings where it can adhere to dust particles. Like uranium, Radon is also radioactive and can wreak havoc on your genetic material if you happen to breathe it in. So it's important to get your home regularly tested, especially if you have a basement where radon could accumulate. Switching gears here, I'll now discuss water pollution, which is the introduction of chemical, physical, and biological agents into the water. Think about what comes to mind when you hear about water pollution you probably conjure the image of a factory dumping sludge from a pipe into the river. This is point source pollution, where the contamination comes from a single identifiable source. Other examples include leaking septic systems, unlined landfills, mine waste, or wastewater treatments. However, 
In most cases, it's difficult to identify where exactly the pollution comes from. 96% of polluted water in the United States comes from non-point sources. For example, runoff can take oil, gas, feces, pesticides, fertilizers, soils, all sorts of things from farms, roads, and residential lawns. Compared to the readily identifiable point sources, non-point pollution is difficult to regulate since it is so diffuse. Eventually, water flows into the ocean, which ends up as a reservoir for all these pollutants. We'll talk here about a few examples of ocean pollution. It's important to keep in mind that 85% of ocean pollution originates from activities carried out on land. Ships dumping garbage and wastewater overboard also occurs, though it's a minor portion. Crude oil is extracted on platforms and transported in large container ships across the ocean. Both of these mechanisms have the potential to fail, potentially causing an oil spill. One of the most recent spills in um, our memory was Deepwater Horizon, which caused 170,000 gallons of oil to make its way into the Gulf of Mexico. This happened because British Petroleum, BP, was negligent in maintaining crucial safety systems on the platform. Oil spills are expensive to clean up and choke the wildlife in the area. But while dramatic, these are only responsible for about 5% of the oil pollution in the ocean. The rest of the oil pollution, 200 to 300 million gallons, comes from runoff from cities and towns. We've already talked a bit about acid precipitation. This is when sulfur and nitrogen oxides in the atmosphere can chemically combine with water vapor to produce acid, which can precipitate down as rain, snow, sleep, etc. This can cause harm to aquatic ecosystems by changing the pH of the water. Besides killing fish directly, this can also prevent eggs from hatching, reducing populations further. Another major acid-related phenomenon is caused by carbon dioxide, which will likely become more of a problem as climate change continues. When this gas dissolves in water, it reacts with already existing carbonate ions to form acid, bicarbonate, and free hydrogen. And this free hydrogen then goes to decrease the pH of the water. So when the carbon dioxide comes in, and consumes carbonate ions from the ocean water, this disrupts shellfish ability to form their protective shells, which also reduces their population because they're not as strong. Without a systematic way to dispose of garbage, such as landfills or incineration, garbage ends up in the ocean. This can be very harmful to marine life who can mistake it for food and thus suffocate. Nets abandoned by fishing vessels can also trap animals who get stuck in them. One of the biggest problems is plastics. These do not ever entirely break down. Instead, they gradually form smaller microplastics, and even nanoplastics, which are essentially impossible to remove, and they can leach their toxins into marine life. Since microplastics can make their way into the food web, they can biomagnify, becoming more concentrated at higher trophic levels. And then if we fish those fish who accumulate it, we can ourselves start to consume some of these microplastics. So today we talked about some major issues regarding air and water pollution. Next week, I'll discuss pollution issues related more directly to North Carolina and climate change. Have a good day.